All right. Our first Bible reading comes from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And the second reading today comes from the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks so much, team. Shane, for leading us through the service. Worship team was incredible. Um, I was just telling Dave earlier, it's just so good to be with you. Um, it's one of my favorite churches to visit, just because I love um, the sense I get every time I walk in here, the, the smiling faces and the familiar faces. It's nice to catch up with you. Um, I had a listen to Dave's sermon last week, and wasn't it incredible? Like, what a thrill. It's almost like God's version of Prison Break. I don't know if you've seen Prison Break, but it's like, oh my goodness, the story is just incredible. So I loved listening to that, and it's a huge privilege for me to share with you today. I, um, in preparation, was telling Dave that one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for the partnership we have with Harborside is because every time I come, it's not just a handful of you that support the work financially. You're doing this together. Everyone is getting involved, and I'm looking at different churches across the country, Australia and New Zealand, and there's churches that give us more financial support, but they're five, ten times the size of you. And so seeing the impact you're having as a handful of people here in Mossman is unbelievable. And so I want to encourage you. Um, it's, it makes a huge difference in the persecuted church. And I feel like you're living out your um, statement to proclaim the hope of Jesus to Mossman and beyond. And so it's just beautiful to, to be here um, and to tell you a little bit about what your support does, but also what we can learn from the believers that we serve. My hope that... My hope is that with every visit, um, this is a bit, I'm closing the gap between you and the persecuted church. That with every visit, you understand a bit more of what it means to come alongside our persecuted belief, uh, brothers and sisters, strengthening what remains, but at the same time that you would have uh, insight into what it means to follow Jesus when things get difficult. That you'd have um, clear things to apply in your own life so that when you go through trials and suffering, you can remember our brothers and sisters around the world who share a faith but not our freedom, and how they walk in hope continuously when everything around them looks so bad. You can title this message, I Will Build My Church in the Face of Persecution. Uh, and if you like uh, alternate, um, alternative titles, in case that one doesn't quite do it for you, you can call it The Audacity of Hope. Um, so much about today's message is hopefully going to come around this idea of hope in the midst of darkness. I know many of you are well aware of uh, what the Ministry of Open Doors does, and, and Dave briefly mentioned last week even just uh, the story of how it started with Brother Andrew and the smuggler's prayer and how he smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain to, to believers who didn't have any. And so now, almost um, 70 years on, we're still strengthening the persecuted church, strengthening what remains. We're doing it, I mentioned it before, in over 70 countries, making sure that we can ensure that the gospel continues going out in places where evil is trying to stop it. And so today we have, sorry, that's the slide of thank you of the work that you've supported us in the region of Afghanistan. Um, but today there's 360 million Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. I feel like that one's a, it's a helpful one to tell you because 2019 was the first time I was here, four years ago, three years ago, oh dear, don't, yeah, 
Fourth time I'm speaking, three years ago. And the number was about 270. 270 million. So there's almost 100 million more believers today that face persecution. As you can see on the screen, it's one in seven believers around the world. In Australia, we have 26, is that right? 25, 26 million people living on this continent. And there's 360 million believers who face persecution for their faith. And so the need is incredibly high. An important um, contextualization of our work is that you might think, oh, are you, are you there to stop persecution? And so often, um, it's actually our, our persecuted brothers and sisters who tell us why we're not doing that. Because they say, look, if, if you'd want to stop persecution, all we have to do is stop sharing Jesus. And persecution goes away. But that's not what we want to do. We want to continue spreading the gospel, making sure that our persecutors can come to faith. And so that's why as a ministry, what we want to do is come alongside and strengthen what remains, the part of the body of Christ that is struggling, not saying, oh, we, we, we um, can't keep going because we don't want to follow Jesus in the light of the difficulty, but it's literally enabling them with the resources they need and don't have to continue being the light and hope of Jesus in their world. As, as I mentioned a, a few weeks, I forget, a few months ago, I was able to visit our work in Egypt. I was able to meet with persecuted believers there, and it was incredible. It was a life-changing experience. And I want to talk, talk you through one of the days that we had. It was day two. Uh, we had just come from a monastery um, that had experienced persecution since the fifth century. So over and over throughout the different centuries, um, the monks were being persecuted, and we had the chance to meet with someone who, who shared different stories around that. But it's the quiet of the de desert that we then went back into Cairo, in the hustle and bustle of downtown Cairo, and we get off the bus and we walk into what is called El Botrosea Church, in the middle of Cairo. In a, in, a, in a matter of seconds, I found myself retracing the footsteps of a suicide bomber. We were shown where the suicide bomber had walked in off the street at 10 a.m. on Sunday, the 11th of December, 2016. A service just like ours. Those familiar with Coptic um, church culture would know that uh, it is tradition that the men walk in on the left of the church and sit on the left, so this side, and the women sit on the right of the church. This newcomer, though, didn't know and obviously clearly uh, started walking towards the wrong door, the door on the right, the one that met, was meant for women. A man named Nabil, who was welcoming people to church, saw him, and he saw that he was walking with a clear goal, and quickly realized something is wrong. He was ignoring the people, welcoming people to church, and Nabil, without giving it a, a second of thought, starts running after him, throws himself around him, and that's when the bomb detonates. 28 women and girls died that day from this attack, including Nabil, of course. I've got some images of the destruction uh, the bomb left. The, the, the church is renovated. Um, on the left, you can see a black tile that the renovation or the church decided to keep in the renovation of the spot marking where the um, suicide bomber detonated the bomb. And then the, the pole next to that spot, you can see the, the marks of the shrapnel of the bomb. This is a difficult picture to see. It's a, a wall outside the church. So if you think this is the entrance, you walk in 40 meters-ish from where the bomb exploded, there's a mark of blood on the wall. And the church has put glass over it to remember the blood of the martyrs of that day. It was unbelievably difficult to stand in that church and to just imagine what it would be like to come back for the people that remain. We had the privilege of meeting Ashraf, who is Nabil's twin brother. He still serves at the church six years on. Listen to these words from Ashraf reflecting on the dreadful day. The sight of the blood and the bodies of the aftermath, in the aftermath of the explosion was unbearable. 
but knowing that Nabil is now crowned in heaven gives me strength. God has supernaturally filled me with condolence, peace, and hope. The audacity of hope. We asked Ashraf, are people still worried and fearful of coming to church? And his response was, without missing a beat, no. Every day we have liturgy, and every day the church is full. He told us that the day after the attack, there was still blood everywhere, the church was destroyed, there was a worship service, and the church was packed. Day after day, for weeks, the church held worship services, glorifying, praising God in the midst of the suffering that they faced. Let me pray, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity we have to gather together as your people here in Mossman. We're so grateful for the privilege it is to be in relationship with you, and Lord, right now we remember the believers, the women and girls in Nabil who lost their lives on the 11th of December in 2016. Lord, we pray that you would move our hearts into, to, towards gratitude for the fact that we're able to come and worship you and gather together without the fear of anyone interrupting our service. Lord, I pray that you would use stories like that, the resilience of the persecuted church, to instill faith in us, that when the weather changes, that we still go to church, that we make it a priority to praise you and give you glory and the honor you deserve. And so as I, I'm going to unpack, unpack your word, I pray that you speak through me and that you'd move the, the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 5, 1 to 5 is, is a passage that I found um, helpful in the face or in, in light of hearing stories like the one I just told you. It reads... Or oh, I'm not going to read it again. Um, we've heard the, the, the five verses. But the chapter five is, is a bit of a glimpse. The first two verses, sorry, of chapter five gives us a glimpse of what Paul will unpack in chapters five to eight, talking about how we're being transformed by the gospel. It's an incredible few chapters. Um, but verses one and two uh, just beautifully puts it together. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We're boasting in the hope of the glory of God, the hope of being renewed humans, renewed humans in whom the living God has come to dwell through and through whom the living God will exercise his wise, redemptive sovereignty over his wounded and waiting creation. In verse 3, We learn that suffering somehow, strangely, is part of the Christian life. Paul doesn't seem to be surprised at all that persecution happens, because he says, we know that suffering produces perseverance. It's not a, and if suffering happens, this is maybe what could could be the result, or uh, in case you're, you're facing any suffering, it's a reality for the church in the New Testament, the early church, that suffering is part of the deal. He says, we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. The word he uses for produce is to work, to work within, to work through. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Evil tries to eliminate hope through suffering. We see it in stories like the one of the church attack in Egypt. The evil that was driving that terrorist caused suffering and wanted to diminish the hope of believers. But it had the opposite effect. It's the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in us. Verse 5 reads, And the hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. As we're being transformed by God, Nabil's brother is able to feel peace and the church was filled with people worshiping God the day after the attack. The persecuted believer that was with us that day um, 
talked about the, the growing of the church in Egypt, despite the persecution. And he said, you know, you need to understand, the blood of the martyrs is the irrigation of the church. When I heard him say that, and Dave heard me talk about this before, I, at first was needing Google Translate because I'm Swiss, I've got no clue what irrigation means. So I look it up, and, and once I understand, oh my goodness, that is a powerful statement. But I'm going to be honest with you, even though I have the translation, I don't fully understand how someone can make a statement like that. I remember standing in that church, seeing the destruction of evil and wrestling with God. How does this all work? But then I read a passage like Romans 5, and it's clear that the early church, and with them the persecuted church, aren't surprised. They know that a decision to follow Jesus is a decision to endure suffering. It comes with the deal. After we had stood in that church and spoken to Ashrav, we got to see what is called the Martyrs Memorial Hall. In a building next door to Elbert Asaya Church, it's a place where the lives of martyrs in Egypt are honored. Here's a photo of one of the rooms that is filled with monuments of believers who were martyred for their faith. Of course, there were monuments for the women and girls that died in the attack of 2016. But I'm telling you, there were hundreds more, each with a box with a, um, a tag that had a saying from a loved one, a family member about them. And our guide read some of them out to us, and some of them said things along the lines of, you try and kill us, but you only make us stronger. You try and persecute us, but the church will prevail. Jesus is building his church in the face of persecution. Hundreds of ordinary people with portraits on the wall a quote about their life, but the next uh, image is, is what shook me, shook all of us. There's a row of empty boxes in anticipation of more attacks, in anticipation that more people will lose their lives for their faith. And another sobering moment of standing in this hall and going, would I continue going to church if I knew that I could be there? If I knew that my family members could be there? See, no matter how difficult and painful it becomes to follow Jesus, the persecuted church are pers persevering, building character and ending up in hope, finding hope during suffering and persecution. Now, as Dave said last week, it doesn't take very long for us to read through Acts, but really, for that matter, the New Testament, before we find ourselves in jail with um, one of the apostles or, or seeing how persecution, um, or sorry, how suffering produces hope. It's, it's all over the New Testament. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians 1, 12 to 14, while he was imprisoned. And sorry, I don't have it on the, on the screen, so let's see how quickly you can find that in your Bibles. I'm just kidding, no one is, um, that's all right, I'm going to read it to you anyway. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and they're all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Isn't that amazing? God uses the perseverance and character that is built in Paul to instill hope and courage in the church around them. And it's really my prayer that this would be your story, that this would be our story, that as we hear about the persecution and imprisonment of millions of believers around the world, that our mission to proclaim the hope of Jesus to Mossman and beyond would come alive. They would be real because we are inspired by the faith of the people that go before us all around the world. See, the beauty, I say this every time, but the beauty of the persecuted church or a partnership with them is that the Bible comes to life. We're not just reading a crazy prison break story of an angel delivering a, a, a Peter out of prison, but we're actually hearing stories today of the same thing. 
and it contextualizes scripture and actually help, helps us un, to understand that these are real stories. These are real people trying to follow Jesus no matter what it costs them. Too often we measure, I measure, my proximity to God by his provision of safety. Too often I go, if, if I'm blessed, if I'm good, then God's near. But if things are difficult, God must be far. The persecuted church understands or has understood and learned for decades and centuries that suffering is at the essence, is the essence of the gospel. I'll say that again, too often we measure our proximity to God by his provision of safety. Whereas the persecuted church has understood that suffering is the essence of the gospel. How are we doing? I know this is, this is a lot. I never want these, these sermons to be just challenging. I pray it's encouraging and inspiring. Are we doing all right? Yeah. Okay, okay. We're about to watch a video about a center of hope in Syria. Uh, the work that you've supported uh, two years ago and the projects that we're going to um, sow into again this year. And I'm so excited about that. It's led by Pastor Edward, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about him. And when I started at Open Doors almost four years ago, it was very early on, I saw an interview that was held with Pastor Edward. He um, was being asked how the situation is going in Syria and the Middle East, and the person interviewing him is, is saying, you know, lots of people are leaving, uh, NATO ambassadors have left the country, are you and your, your wife going to leave as well because it's not safe to stay? And without missing a beat, they always are so quick to this, but without missing a beat, he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. If we leave, it's a, it's a disaster. As Christians, we are heaven's ambassadors. And can you imagine a country without heaven's ambassadors in it? There's this beautiful picture of who we are as Christians, who we are as Jesus followers in our communities, in our families. We're heaven's ambassadors, and we've got this privilege to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world, and Pastor Edward clearly understands that. Such a powerful way to describe Jesus' followers. So we're going to watch that video in a moment. It gives you a bit of insight into one of the little pieces that one center of hope is doing in the Middle East. So turn your eyes to the screen. Oh, sorry, that's me. It's me clicking through. There we go. Didn't start playing. Oh, it did. Sorry. Hi, I'm Pastor Edward. Uh, we are in the church in Damascus. The clinic was established in 2006, starting helping Iraqi refugees in particular. And when the war came in uh, Syria, the clinic proved to be very instrumental in helping people. Now we're here in Duela area where the, our clinic is located. It's called Jesus is the Light of the World. We see like hundreds of uh, patients monthly. We have several clinics, OBGYNs, uh, dental clinic, uh, x-rays, uh, orthopedist, pediatrician. So we serve a good range of people who are really poor and uh, looking for a clinic that can serve them with uh, love, and show them the church is taking care of them. We don't distinguish between Christian or Muslim. We serve all the people who are in need. It gives them hope. It gives them a feel of uh, being loved from somebody. This is what the church role here uh, is to extend the hands of Jesus to everybody who is in need. What might be surprising to many that although the war is over in the sense of explosions, but the situation is more devastating because the economy is collapsing completely. And for the first time, we can see uh, people who used to be middle class, like engineers, are just waiting for the food parcels. And uh, the need is really growing by the day. The support of the church globally is uh, very vital. Uh, we experience something spiritually very valuable. Uh, we know that we are not left alone. We belong to a larger body of Christ that is really standing with us uh, all through the past years and still standing with us. 
And actually, those different ministries are enabling the church to reach out to the community, uh, loving them and touching their uh, real needs. So we definitely uh, appreciate the support and prayers of the church globally. I find that so inspiring. I find it so exciting to see the church being the hands of Jesus, and we're able to do that. I'm so excited to invite you to partner with us again this year to build and maintain more centers of hope in Iraq. So far, there is about 65 to 70 percent of churches in Iraq that have become centers of hope, and our goal, our vision, is for every church to be one of those centers of hope, enabling the church in the Middle East to come alongside the hopeless, the hurting, the needy, and the broken. See, the church in the Middle East is persevering. Their character is built in the midst of it, and hope is rising in their hearts. But they need our resources and our prayer so that they can, exp- so, so that they can serve the people around them and they themselves can experience that hope. It's the beauty of the ministry of Open Doors to be able to share stories with you like those and invite you into partnership to come alongside Jesus, quite literally, building his church. You know, we obviously understand that the church isn't just the physical building, it's it's the people, but we're enabling people to be the church, to regather, to regroup, to strengthen the Christian presence in Iraq so that the hope of Jesus can continue going out into the darkest and most hopeless places. I want to take a bit of a turn and just look at the passage in in Habakkuk for a second, because um, I had a challenge a couple of months ago where I was like, I want to read more more books in the Bible that I don't just go to, um, like Romans. Um, And so I went to Habakkuk, and it was fascinating because, especially in Egypt, especially standing in that church, Um, I resonated with what Habakkuk is writing about. And the first few chapters, there's only three, so in the first one, really, he has an argument with God. He cries out to God, and he he asks God, why are you making me look at these injustices? Why Why are you making me look at the suffering in this world? Why are you not doing anything about it? And quite similarly, I can respond to stories I hear every day from the persecuted church. I can tell myself on one end I want to believe or want to learn how the church is persevering in the midst of suffering, but there's that realness in me where I'm going, but God, why? Why have you chosen that to work through suffering? And not that I think I can explain it to you or help you all understand it and we can all leave and and have our questions answered, but I believe there's some helpful um, things that can guide us when we read these verses in Habakkuk. He talks about in chapter 3 that although nothing is going like it's supposed to, and in the time there, it's like the fig trees aren't budding, there's no um, harvest in the field, even though everything looks bad, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And so I believe there are three elements that, we can help, that can help us break down how we can rejoice in God in the midst of suffering. And those three things are repeating, remembering, and rejoicing. See, the Bible is full of repetition. We can see it here in verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And he says it again, just in a different way. I will be joyful in God my Savior. As a teenager, I remember reading the Old Testament, the poems, and I'd be like, oh my goodness, I got it, God. Like, why are we saying this over and over again? As the older I get, the the more I realize (laughs) A lot of the things that God says multiple times still aren't quite sitting in my head. So there's clearly a reason. And it's actually helpful. Like I, I love that we have you know, memory verses in, in kids' church. I'm like, maybe we should bring it to adult church because how good is it when we remember Scripture? And so that kind of brings me to the next point. If we repeat the truth of who God is, if we repeat the truth of who God is to us, we quite literally remember it easily easier. By repeating and learning the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is with us through it all, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God's with us no matter what is going on in our lives. And by remembering that, 
That is what enables us to rejoice in times of need, in times of despair, in times of suffering. Who knows how long we're going to have easy access to Scripture? I know we currently can take the phone out and have 70 million different translations and, and versions on our phone. But what if that goes away? What are, going, what are we going to repeat so we can remember and therefore rejoice in difficult times like Habakkuk, but really like the persecuted church that is able to draw on truths that they repeatedly remembered and are able to rejoice in it? Jesus is building his church in the face of persecution. It means that he will continue building his church, his people, sorry, to be heaven's ambassadors until the end of time. The people of God are experiencing increased pressures all over the world. We saw one in seven believers are suffering for their faith. But as Paul writes in Romans, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. It's because of the chains of our brothers and sisters, the persecution they face for Jesus' sake, that, our, that other parts of the body are emboldened in their faith, encouraged to follow Jesus no matter what it costs them, and that's definitely true for me, and I pray that that's the truth for yourselves. I don't want this to be just an annual visit of open doors where you hear stories and then um, with normal life kind of happening, you forget about it and you hear it again next year. I want us to see how the persecuted church can quite literally be a mentor to our faith. And it's actually, you don't need, and Dave does this beautifully, you don't need open doors to come every weekend. You just got to read scripture, and over and over and over again, you see how the church is persevering throughout suffering, and how much we can learn from them in the midst of that. Remember, don't measure your proximity to God by his provision of safety. He's closer than you know in the darkest of times. Now, I know we've spoken about centers of hope a lot before, even two years ago, but um, just to, to remind you of what they're actually doing. I'm going to give you a bit of a list of things. I've listed a few just in case I missed some. There's discipleship training and Bible studies, leadership training, trauma care, Christian education, legal support. One of the things I saw, and that's crucial to our work, is when we do literacy training, we use scripture to help people learn how to read and write. Oftentimes, that's non-believers coming to our programs and literally just having scripture to learn writing and reading. Today, you have the opportunity to come alongside our work in, the, in Iraq, enabling the church to remain, the church to be built and strengthened so that they can continue shining the light and hope of Jesus in, their, in, in the darkest of times in their scenarios, in their lives, in their communities. I've got a video to show you um, that just dives a bit deeper into the trauma support, and I want to just, I guess, pause there for a second the stories I told you about, uh, the story I told you about the attack in the church in Egypt, the, the multiples and thousands of millions of people that have lost their lives for their faith, it's so easy for myself even to see them as potentially even stories like we see from the Bible that doesn't quite connect that these are people like you and I. These are people like you and I who have lost their mom, their husband, their brother, their sister, their son or their daughter, and there's incredible trauma that comes with that. There's the ability that they've built the resilience in their faith to continue trusting God in it all, but what they're dealing with is incredibly traumatic experiences. And so one of our beautiful arms of those centers of hope is trauma care, coming alongside people, equipping them with the tools they need to be able to continue following Jesus courageously, but also just to be able to continue living their lives in a healthy way. And so turn your eyes to the screen for this video about our trauma care work in Iraq.
أنا فيان من ألقاش وحدة من المشاركات في مدرسة المشورة لمدة ست شهور لحد هسه تعتبر دراسة لكسب خبرات أو حتى نقدر نفهم الأشخاص واحتياجاتهم طبيعة شغلي كباحثة اجتماعية في المنطقة بس زادت الحاجة لهيك نوع من التدريبات خاصة وراء داعش إنه دخل للمنطقة فصار هواية نزوح هواية ناس تشردت نسحت ماتت بشكل عام وبشكل خاص إحنا كمسيحيين يعني فشفنا إنه شفت إنه من الممكن إنه أنا أشارك بهاي المدرسة حتى أكون أطور من هاي الخبرات حتى ممكن أقدر بالمستقبل أكون مشيرة بهاي المنطقة. أنا بالنسبة لي أعمل إنه ورا ما تخرج إنه أقدر أساعد ممكن أقدر أساعد الناس شغلات تساعد الناس إنه ما يكونون إنه أكو ناس يفكرون بيهم إنه أكو ناس موجودين إنه بالشيء أو الخبرات اللي أنا تعلمتها وأشجع ونكون حتى نبني كمجتمع اللي يعيش بيه مجتمع قوي وصحي